Good morning. Thank you all for coming. Uh, today's workshop is Left Behind Harvest, Designing a Path for Distributing the Abundance. Uh, and every year at Free the Seeds, we try to do a couple community discussions in addition to the technical workshops. Uh, this is partly informational and it's partly trying to come up with solutions on a community scale. I'm excited today because we have a great panel up here. Uh, from left to right, we have Michael McCormick from the Livingston Food Resource Center, Lauren Gerald from North Valley Food Bank and White Fish, Ted Weichel from owner of the North Shore Farm in Summers, Montana, and Tim Manley, who is a wildlife management specialist with Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, based out of Kalispell. Kalispell. Wherever. <laughs> so, pretty diverse panel, and they're all going to kind of come at this topic of sort of surplus food on the landscape, the idea of gleaning, why it's why surplus food is an issue or an opportunity, sort of what we're going to hit on today. So, to begin, uh, maybe just working down the line, if we want to hit on how does unharvested food on the landscape affect each of you in your given roles and your responsibilities? You can talk a little bit more about what each of you do. Um, and then depending on your roles, do you view this surplus food as an untapped resource? Is it a loss of potential income? Or maybe in Tim's case, it's a conflict issue. So Michael, if you want to kick it off. You're going to make me go first. Tim, you want Well, uh, let me give you a little context um, around my, comp my position and, and involvement relative to this subject. At the Livingston Food Resource Center, we bring in as much fresh, locally produced food as possible to minimally process in our commercial kitchen, which we have in our center for distribution in our food pantry. So I'm always looking for new sources uh, of Montana grown food. I do forward contracting with farmers around the state to buy everything from broccoli to beets and we bring it in minimally process it. The first thing I tell farmers when I'm working with them and, and putting, putting together uh, memorandums of understanding to buy certain foods from them is sell me your seconds. Now I want to create, I want to help create a market for seconds um, so we don't waste that food. And at the same time, I'm looking for opportunities to do things like gleaning so that we can again not waste any food and we can bring it in and use that food in ways that will help us feed people in need in our community. So that's that's how I, I look at this subject. Uh, I'm, I'm looking for sourcing and gleaning, of course, is one way that we can source. But before I get to gleaning, because our center is all about economic development, I'm, I'm talking to farmers about buying from them, creating markets for them that didn't exist before. And then gleaning is, as a source is a, is a ways down the list, okay? I think farmers should be happy to hear that. <laughs> Good, well, I want them to be. Okay, Mark. Uh, so currently I'm the uh, Director of Operations for the North Valley Food Bank and one of my major responsibilities is to um, purchase and source food to distribute to our clients. Um, currently we're buying a lot from the grocery store and who knows where those carrots you know, come from or the potatoes that I'm buying, apples, oranges. So um, I do think that there is um, potential to shift here in the Baja Valley where food banks source their food. I would love to explore um, how I can get, I know we have got carrots locally at times um, before I worked for them, but how can we um, do a little bit more of what's happening at the Livingston um, Resource Center? Um, we have apples and carrots and potatoes all grown here in this valley, so um, it seems a little bit silly for me to buy them from the grocery store and get them from somewhere out of state. So 
Um, if gleaning is the method in which we can do that, I would, I, I'm very interested in exploring that more. Currently, it, there doesn't seem to be a lot of structure in how to make that happen. So um, there, we just need to build it and find those avenues in the way that they've um, done at the Livingston Resource Center. My name is Ted Wycall from the North Shore Farm uh, between Summers and Big Fork on Highway 82. And we, you know, from year to year, uh, over the last roughly 15 years that we've been farming, not there, but in other places as well, um, you know, there is always going to be some unharvested food on the farm. And it's kind of an untapped resource. Um, the reasons why that food is unharvested there could be several reasons. Uh, first off, we might not actually have the labor to actually get it harvested. Um, that's always like a pressing issue is finding enough hands to actually get the work done. Um, and then other reasons why it might not be harvested is it might not be like in prime condition. It might be um, carrots that got too big or uh, you know peas that peas that. Uh, you know, just took a little bit too much heat and they just got a little bit too big because of the heat, it could be the lettuce, whatever, you know, the lettuce heads aren't growing right, they got doubled up in the greenhouse or something before they were planted. There's always issues like that. Um, and so there is unharvested food. Um, there always is, it's just kind of a fact of the farm. We try to minimize that as much as possible, but sometimes uh, it happens. Uh, I don't view it as too much of a loss. Um, we do have some investment in that, the time that it took to plant, the cost of the seeds, those kinds of things. Um, but uh, as long as that food is, you know, it's, it would be great to be able to utilize that for human consumption, but as long as that food remains, like the carrots or whatever it might be, if it goes back in the soil, there's no net loss to the farm. It could actually be a, a small, you know, very small, almost unmeasurable gain of like organic matter, nutrients, that kind of thing. Um, what we do really try to utilize as much as possible is food that we harvest that does not get sold. And so um, there's always going to be, you know, the two big things that come to mind immediately is squash and cucumbers. And so those are very prolific plants. Um, like the, you know, the old joke is, is if your neighbor has a you know, squash plant in their garden, lock your car doors because in the morning, you know, I get a basket of squash in the back seat, you know. Um, but, uh, so basically what we have done is we work with the Big Fork Food Bank and every Monday morning, first thing in the morning, they come and we basically, uh, all the food, and we harvest almost on a daily basis. So on Monday morning there will be potential vegetables that haven't been sold at the farmer's market on Saturday. It's, you know, it was only harvested on Friday. Um, so it's still super fresh, probably fresher than most grocery store vegetables would be. but. The, the Big Fork Food Bank will come Monday morning and they back the van up and whatever we have that um, was unsold from farm, farmer's market or you know whatever, um, that all gets loaded into the van on a weekly basis. So we really try to not waste anything if it's already been harvested. Um, I always do look at the field and I see that if there is something that we're not able to harvest, it would be great if there was maybe an outside crew that could come in when needed, when the opportunity arises, to get that out of the field and utilize. But, um, that's, kind of, that's kind of what we deal with on a regular basis on the farm, is unharvested food that's in the field and then harvested food that hasn't been sold. We try to minimize both of those things, but um, you know, I think from time to time, there's always gonna be something that falls into one of those categories. So. Uh, my name is Tim Manley, and I work for Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and I do the grizzly bear management. And I've been doing that since 1993, basically responding to human-grizzly conflicts. And so the reason I was asked to be on the panel was because we deal a lot with grizzly bears that get into fruit trees, and a lot of people don't harvest their fruit. And so um, we'll get calls from people that say, I've got, you know, 30-year-old pear, pear or plum trees on my property, and the bears are breaking them down to get to the fruit. It's like, well, pick your fruit. Well, I can't really pick my fruit. I'm 80 years old, and I, you know, but I don't want to lose my fruit trees. So those are the types of things that we deal with. So since 93, 
um, I've had over, I've had 460 captures on grizzly bears, and about 10% of those have been bears getting into fruit trees, causing issues. And so, um, you know, we try to work with the landowners on preventing problems like pick your fruit, use electric fencing to keep the bears from getting into stuff. But a lot of times they're just unable to keep up with the demand or the, the production of fruit under trees. So we've been looking for ways to um, get people that have fruit trees together with people that are looking for fruit. And so uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but that's kind of an introduction as to why I'm here. And I'm hoping to um, uh, you know, hear some discussions in terms of some options because we've got a lot of people with a lot of fruit trees and we're trying to figure out how to get the fruit off the trees and get it where people can do that. Yes. I'm excited about this panel because just hearing those intro remarks, I feel like there's a lot of solutions that could happen mm -hmm. yeah. very easily by just connecting resources to each other. But I don't want to get ahead of us because we're going to get there. So before we dive into that, briefly, what for, for each of you again, what do you think the scope of this issue is in your daily work? How much do you rely on uh, the seconds market, a gleaning market? Uh, maybe for Tim, how much, you kind of hit on it, how much fruit is out there in the valley? Uh, just to give us a side, like an understanding of the scale of this issue. Go ahead, Tim, you can work back. <laughs> we'll work backwards. Um, there's a lot of fruit in the valley. And a lot of what I deal with, of course, is private land. And uh, we even have fruit trees up in Whitefish. And the city of Whitefish has agreed they're going to remove their fruit trees this year because they couldn't get people to pick them. And so there's plenty of private fruit trees out there that are available that Whitefish is going to end up removing their fruit trees up there that's on their city property because of all the bears. We had 26 black bears in Whitefish last year, last fall, in the fruit trees. So most of the the issues with fruit are from mid-August until uh, the first part of November. And of course, September and October is when it's the busiest. Uh, I had eight grizzlies and fruit trees, plum, pear, and apple trees down by Egan Slough along the Flathead River. And we tried, <coughs> tried and tried to get people to come pick the fruit. My technician actually went down and picked the fruit and donated it to the uh, folks that makes apple cider. And so, the other thing that I heard of, I mean, there's there's fruit all through the valley, Foot Hills Road, you know, all all, uh, all through the valley, apples, pears, plums, some peaches, um, and most landowners seem to be willing to have people come pick the fruit. It's a matter of trying to of people who want to go do it, and some of the landowners say if they come pick it, they can just have it. And we've also want to contact the food banks. And you know if they're willing to take it, I think I even talked to Ted last year. If people have fruit in and want to, you know, can sell it or something, is that a possibility? Um, the other thing that I heard, and I really need to check out, is I heard some of the cherry orchards on Flathead Lake aren't even picking their cherries because they're using Washington cherries instead of Flathead cherries. So there's some big, possibly some big producers along Flathead Lake that aren't even harvesting. And some of their neighbors are calling me because they're complaining because the bears are coming in to the cherry orchards because the fruit's not being harvested and then they have to go there and have their place. So, um, you know, we've got some ideas and I'll talk about that a little bit more. But, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big thing. And uh, like I said, we get a lot of calls about people with bears in their trees getting any fruit. So we just need to try to figure out how to get the fruit picked and get it so it's used. So, <clears throat> Uh, I think one of the big untapped resources uh, in the valley might be to get some kind of an organizational structure for people that can preserve food. Um, one of the, it, it, was, it was a pretty amazing uh, thing to see this summer, but we had, um, we have a fairly large cattail marsh behind the, behind the farm, and so, this, it was like late summer, um, all the red-winged blackbirds that had fledged and flew the nest um, flocked up and there was like tens of thousands of them. And while I was at the Cowswell Farmer's Market one morning, um, I got a call from our babysitter that alerted me to the fact that there was like 10,000 blackbirds in the sweet corn patch. 
And so I rushed home, I go out in the field, and sure enough, it's like totally covered by blackbirds. And um, I scared them away, and then I surveyed the damage, and it was basically each ear of sweet corn, like every single one of them, had just been shredded at the very tip, and they had just pecked like the top inch of corn kernels. And uh, it was very discouraging, very frustrating. Um, it was an ongoing process to keep them out of the next successional planting of corn that we had. We had many more, so I spent several weeks uh, not leaving the farm until like maybe 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning when, they, when the pressure seemed to subside. Um, but the solution that we had for that instance, and this, is, this doesn't happen very often. I have never actually had something like this happen um, ever. And uh, it, was, it was pretty amazing. All that we had to do was make one phone call to one church group in the Lower Valley. And they showed up with about a dozen people. They gleaned pretty much all the sweet corn that was damaged and uh, took it home. And they spent like days uh, canning it. And they made like hundreds and hundreds of like really nice quart jars of corn. And uh, we got a little bit of that, and then the rest of it was shared within their community. Um, but I thought that that was like the perfect solution to that problem. Um, so yeah, if there was some kind of a canning club or some kind of an like, outreach group or something like that, um, for certain circumstances like that, or for yard trees, yard fruit trees, such as you know the apples and the plums and those kinds of things, um, all of that food, I'm sure there's people out there that, could, that would love to utilize that. And uh, I think just getting, just letting them know, they have to kind of be like poised and ready to, you know, they got to strike while the iron's hot, get in there while the, while the get is good. But um, as long as that's, that can be managed, that would be a really nice solution to uh, utilize that because there's people that do use that for subsistence in the wintertime. So. I want all of that food. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah. We have people who need that food. Um, so, we um, currently aren't really, we don't have any teams together that would go out and harvest this, but it's something that we're interested in. Um, we are right now on the verge of um, implementing some elements of our strategic plan that would move us from um, a box method of distributing food to our customers. Um, so it, it's prepackaged by volunteers and then handed to somebody as they come through the door. Uh, we're moving away from that into more of a choice model, which so we'd be set up as a grocery store, so um, our clients can come through and shop as all of us would at the grocery store. But what's, what we're doing alongside that is um, installing a commercial kitchen. So processing food is something that we're very interested in and hearing about all these the apples and you know potentially corn things like that if we ha have a commercial kitchen um, we can do that uh, and that that would just be I think there's um, something exciting there in the future we have a lot of volunteers and if we have a commercial kitchen it just seems like there's a way to connect the dots and get that food to people in our community who have um, insufficient nutrition in their families <coughs> The, the only thing that we're doing currently is sometimes folks will call us to harvest um, fruit trees and then we'll spontaneously get a group of volunteers together to do that. But it could certainly be more organized and I'm excited to try and do that. That would be awesome. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a little bit sad to me that Whitefish is um, going to pull out some of their fruit trees and I'd love to talk more about that because I wonder if there's a way we can <coughs> support harvesting that fruit so that doesn't be worth happen. talking to them for sure yeah yeah, yeah. Was, tell them, was it about two years ago that everything in Montana was producing apples seemed like in, in Livingston about two years ago rose bushes cactus plants they were all <laughs> producing apples and we were just awash in apples and had it not been for a couple of teams that uh, Ted spoke about, um, we, we would not have known what to do with them because we were getting apples. People were just coming by the center, dropping off boxes of apples. Um, I can tell you, we learned to make applesauce in a hurry. <laughs> one, of the, uh, one of the tools in our kitchen 
um, is a 40 gallon steam jacketed kettle and for several days we were cooking apples and the ones that were prettier we put into the food pantry for distribution for people to pick up fresh um, but we we got pretty organized pretty creative in a hurry um, luckily up on top of Bozeman Pass many of you may have passed by the uh, the grizzly bear place there well those bears loved the apples so we were taking cases of apples you know the, the small ones the ones with worms in them etc up to the to the bears we also made applesauce in apple pie filling and shared with uh, our local soup kitchen so essentially we became a clearinghouse of of fruit in this case particularly apples and we depended on a team of volunteers to make much of that happen and um, I think um, you know that's that's really the key that Ted spoke to it as well when you when you become overwhelmed by some of this availability how do you respond and it really takes a team of people to to respond effectively and you've got to be creative in terms of how do you best use all this fruit once you've got it so I think you know we've all got to be looking for, for ways creative ways to to uh, find markets for this produce so let's jump ahead a little bit with that closing remark in terms of ideas that you have seen utilize or things you envision but they're just the pieces don't fit together right now I know like as a farmer Ted's point of for a farm to go out and harvest surplus produce is not economically viable because they're paying labor um, Michael you hit on making a seconds market where you can compensate a farmer and then Tim hit on the idea that there's all this fruit but finding the people to go out there who are willing to glean is an issue. So is there anything that you've seen or you think would work in terms of sort of closing the loop on this? Ideas, who who should organize? You know, what's a format for organizing it? Yeah. I can I can address that to start with. Um, we get a lot of these calls and there's just myself and my technician that basically respond to these conflicts and deal with the people. And so last year I asked my technician Justine to create a fruit gleaning page on Facebook. So it's called Flathead Fruit Gleaning. So if you're on Facebook, Flathead Fruit Gleaning. And the idea of that was to get, and we just did it last fall, was to get people that have fruit trees to go on the Facebook page and people that are looking to pick fruit to go on the Facebook page. And we just put it up last fall, and we have over 370 followers on it so far. And so, you know, um, we didn't want to have something where it took a lot of our time to coordinate. And we thought, well, this is a way to get people together to talk, and, and they can work it out amongst themselves as to whether, you know, who wants the fruit, you know, are they going to take it somewhere and, and donate it somewhere. So they're going to work all that out. So, we're going to continue working on that page and try to increase the exposure. Um, you know, we have good ways to do that through our INE. You know, Dylan Tavish is our INE guy. We can do press releases, so we have the ability to contact a lot of people. And uh, so we just started it last year, and it's we followed kind of a template that was done by um, uh, the Great Bear Foundation out of Missoula, and they started. A, gleaning project down there and uh, one year they, they had over 5,900 pounds of fruit that they took and they basically it was it was apples and they gave to Western Cider and they basically Western Cider made it into cider sold it and 10% of the profit went back to the Great Bear Foundation you know to go towards bear conservation bear smart out of Durango uh, down in Colorado they have a community project it's called uh, Good Food Collective, and they've been doing this for quite a few years, and it's to keep black bears from getting in, getting into fruit trees. And they have a coalition of partners. They use community college, they use uh, local food bank, and volunteers, of course, to collect the food, and they basically distribute it through the community food 
uh, organizations. And then up in Canada, Revelstoke, BC, uh, they have what's called the Revelstoke Bear Wear Program. And they have volunteers that do the same. They go out, pick the fruit, they may keep some of it, give some to the landowners if they want it, and the rest is donated to the community food bank. So there are organizations out there in place that we kind of follow the template and maybe we're a little bit behind the, the curve up here in terms of getting an organization together but when we first started doing it we talked to people we we ended up finally contacting food bank they said yeah we'll take the food but when we first started talking to people they said oh, food bank's not interested they won't take any of your food and so it's good to hear that there is an interest in it and so you know we're going to try to grow that program and, and that's something that uh, hopefully will help keep bears from getting into the fruit and also people being able to use it because there's a lot of it out there. And hopefully with the audience that's here at Free the Seeds, mm -hmm. we can get those Facebook numbers up pretty quickly. Yeah. So tapping into this resource to help connect the dots. Yep. Yeah, it sounds like a fantastic idea. The power of social media is, I think, probably the perfect thing to used to uh, get the word out when there's a surplus or an opportunity for people to get some food. Um, yeah, I don't know. I I, I think uh, if, if, there, if there's people out there that want it and they can get the message that it's available and they can get there in time to get it, um, man, that sounds like a great way to do it. Um, I don't know. I just... I, a mob approach. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Flash yeah. mob. Yes. The crop mob. Yep. Hell, hell mob. just the... To add, Helena, our Helena office is looking to see how this goes up here, and if it goes well, they're going to try to do it statewide in terms of that. So, you know, that's something they're kind of keeping an eye on. Sorry, that's good. So, Warren, maybe in your comments, talk about the resources that the food bank has, like, or and even Michael as well. It's, you can have private individuals go out and get fruit, but in terms of also getting it into the food system through those uh, centers, does the food bank have resources to organize groups, or is there a way for you to tackle that? Yeah, it's, way? Mm -hmm. it would be, uh, we currently have three staff members. Um, there, we have the, our executive director, myself as the director of operations and administrative assistant. Just in the last few weeks, um, myself and the executive director have gone to full time. So it has been a very, very small staff team until very recently. Um, and so I think we're building some capacity to handle projects and make larger volunteer groups, um, you know, increase some of the programming, you know, um, we have a commercial kitchen, how we're gonna use it, you know, we're, we're increasing our capacity. So I think that um, moving forward, we probably can do more and accept more. Um, but that still will probably present itself as an issue. You know, we're um, serving a significant number of people and there's only like really two and a half of us, you know, uh, in terms of our, um, the hours that we're putting in um, at the food bank. So uh, it really would be very much fueled by volunteers um, to, um, that, that is the resource that we have as volunteers. But we have a large group of volunteers, so I think we just need to communicate um, more. I, I, it seems like um, there needs to be a little bit of, there's like needs to be a communication structure, like who do you call when you have right. corn? And, and so, and that can be something that all farmers can have access to, who do you call, who do you call? And uh, what are these different avenues um, to connecting the people who, can come and help um, in these circumstances. So I, I see there being some kind of communication tool or a little bit of structure around that to um, help support this. But Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, as you know, the director of operations, I'm very excited to be part of it. Um, we just need to kind of get into brainstorming and find the methods that work for everybody. Uh, Michael, I'll maybe prompt you because having heard some of your other talks, you've been very creative in how you've uh, maybe built capacity. So relative to Warren's comments, maybe any insights on what North Valley Food Bank could do uh, to increase capacity? Well, I think to increase capacity, Livingston, Whitefish, whatever, you need to anticipate these, these situations, these opportunities, and we've got in place a, a kind of a calling tree, if you will, 
an organizational approach to creating teams on short notice, teams of volunteers who have been, I don't want to say pre-screened, but they've all been identified and matched to certain types of interests. I mean, we've got a team of people who are out there waiting like, uh, you know, a volunteer fire department uh, who want to go pick apples and collect fruit in people's yards. So when somebody says, okay, we've got an opportunity, then we just put that into motion. And, and that team gets called and they're given direction and they go to work collecting that fruit, bringing it into the center. Now, <clears throat> the, the center at that point begins to perform, I think, some very important functions here because fresh fruit is, you know, it's not going to last forever. You, you've, you're up against some, some timing issues. Um, we're fortunate in, in that regard that we've got uh, sizable cold storage. So we can bring crates, pallets of apples in and store it at 40 degrees until we're ready to make applesauce or take some other, <clears throat> some other action. So you've really, you, you've got to think about this as a continuum of, okay, we, when we bring this fruit in, what's our timeline? What are our marketing opportunities, our distribution opportunities? How are we going to prepare this food for the marketplace? Be that people coming into the food pantry to, to pick up food or provide it to other organizations like your local soup kitchen. I know I think as, as food banks, we've got to think uh, more broadly in terms of what are the outlets, what are the opportunities, because that's going to drive how we manage, how we how we handle that fruit when it is available to us. And then to take it maybe off topic, but not really, in terms of a food bank that's facing the crunch of two and a half employees, relying on donations for a lot of it, you've been pretty creative in terms of generating revenue within the center that then allows you to build the capacity to have more people uh, training programs, maybe? Well, as, as I frequently say to people, the Livingston Food Resource Center isn't really about hunger. It's about solving poverty, and we can't feed people out of poverty, so we go about creating programs and taking actions that relate to three areas, economic development, health care, and education. If we can leverage our role in the local education system, health care system, the local economic system, the local economy, if we can drive meaningful change in those areas, then hunger will begin to solve itself. So I see our role in the community as, as, a, <clears throat> as, a, as an engine to drive change, to drive program implementation in those three areas. So when we look at an abundance of apples, immediately we're thinking about, well, what are the economic opportunities here? How can we take all these apples and use them to the greatest economic advantage for this community. How can we feed people with those apples that will drive better, better health outcomes? How can we educate people in this community to use these apples? So it's, it's, it's a multi-layered kind of approach, Todd. And uh, uh, you know, we've, we've created the assets we need to pursue those different areas. So due to time constraints, I think at this point, uh, I'm gonna open it up to the audience members. If anybody has any questions for the panel. Um, just, just a statement and everything. My name's Bobby Yee. I am the new operations manager for the Flathead Food Bank here in Kalispell. Um, I've been with them since November. I've officially took over. Um, last February for Matt. Uh, basically what we're looking at is expanding the operations to make it 
uh, a main distribution center like Missoula. So instead of everybody waiting six weeks for their, their product and stuff, they can come get it directly from us instantly. So you can have every sh everything shipped there. We're planning on expanding. We're looking at building, uh, the bu um, expanding our pantry and everything else like that. We're looking at building anywhere between a 3,000 to 4,000 square foot commercial kitchen also to uh, process stuff. But we're looking at, like you said, how to get the product in and then how to use it and utilize it, but then also how to educate the people on not, you know, how to process, how to cook, how to use, and how we do things in that. The other, the other thought was is that, yes, you only have three people. I have three people. Big Four has two people. Columbia Falls has three. Let's get on a calling trip. We got a dozen people right there to go pick something, you know? It's something that we're, we're yeah, that I'm, uh, myself and Jamie have been looking at to try to expand and help the valley to, you know, to, to use more of these resources to make sure that it's being uh, properly um, um, gleaned or donated, uh, processed, educated, and put out to the public in as many forms as possible, not just a plain apple, like I said, applesauce, apple juice, you know, um, different things, you know, show them you know, show how to shred potatoes to make and freeze those to make hash browns or whatever it may be, but then also to educate people. So there is a big plan here to definitely expand the Flathead Food Bank in itself. And we want to work with everybody else to make sure that we can, you know, you know, share. Because I've got other contacts that can talk about other farmers and ranchers. I have one um, specific uh, cherry farmer down at Flathead Lake that last year um, put in a, a ton and a half of cherries to the, the co-op. And they, they kicked back a half a ton of cherries because they didn't want them and he had to get rid of them. So we will, you know, this year I've already arranged that we will take those, whether we have to purchase them or buy them or have people come out. We will make sure that we get at least a half a ton of, of flathead cherries into us, and, and, if not even more. So there's other options, other things. We get so much food in there that it's, it's like um, Mike says, it's not only us using it, how to utilize it, but it's, it's a three-step process. We have to also educate the people on, on what to do with it, you know, how to properly take care of it instead of just, you know, mashed potato, mashed potato, or, or I eat an apple, and if it's, if it's bad, then I'm done with it. We're also going to build um, walk-in coolers so we can have storage for other facilities that we can actually drive a pallet truck, you know, forklift in and put pallets down and stack them on shelves, just like um, Glacier Wholesale. You know, when you go into that huge freezer, it's, you know, 30 feet high, but we can, you know, we can store stuff. We can make sure that we have things here in the valley available for people. <clears throat> so when Helena says that, hey, you know, Bobby, I've got, you know, four ton of pork and I don't know what to do with it. Can you help me out? Yeah, I'll take four ton of pork because then I can distribute it around the whole valley. You know, I can say instead of everybody getting, you know, five pounds of pork, you get 10 pounds of pork this week. You know, just to, to move it out, to make sure that we do those things. So I want to, you know, want everybody to know that, you know, we're here and available. I'm here and available for you also. And we want to grow this. We want to be a part of this. We want to make this a main hub so we don't have to depend on anybody else except yourselves. Okay, so Bobby Yee, Flathead Food Bank. <laughs> Every, you know, Tim, Tim and I go back, way back. So it's just Bobby at FlatheadFoodBank.com and you'll get a hold of me on my email and I'll, I'll send you, you know, hit you right back and we'll go from there. Okay? Congratulations on your position. Oh yeah, like I said, I'm not all done with law enforcement, but I want to be in service. <laughs> 15 years of law enforcement, that's enough. So I still want to be of service though and politics is not my thing. <laughs> Smart man. Yes. Um, so my name is Whitney Pratt. I'm a farm manager of a farm here in Whitefish, Purple Frog Gardens, and I also am on the board of Farm Hands Nourish, um, which works to connect farmers with people. We just want people to eat the food that we grow. And I've been trying to do this for a few years, but I'm one of those people who has too many projects. Um, but Butte does something. So on September 11th, it's a day of service, especially for AmeriCorps members. And in Butte, they do this huge gleaning day on September 11th. And so home gardens, orchards, farms, anything, they just, they have a ton of volunteers and people say like, oh yeah, I have way too much kale this year. Come and pick it. Oh yeah, I'm not gonna pick those apple trees. And so they have volunteers who go out and harvest everything. And then they have chefs in their food banks who have another group of volunteers who take all that food and process it into something that can go home to the food bank clients, which I think is some of the link that I'm excited about is some of the food we get, people don't know how to use it or they don't know what to do with it. And so that's a one day event. It will not cover all the surplus that we have, but 
But I would love to organize something like that. I think we have the volunteers, we have the AmeriCorps members also, <laughs> to be able to do something like that. Um, and if we did something valley-wide, we could do a couple, like one in September, one in October. I think we could get a lot of food and do some of that education, connect more people. So I'm very excited in planning something like that. I've talked to folks in Butte several times about what they do. I just need help. So we're here for them. You pass around a list of people's name and email that are interested? Sure. I'm Wendy Coyne. I'm a board member of the North Valley Food Bank. And like, I just would love to know, I think Lauren's comment when she first spoke is an important one, that there's not this coordination in the valley for this. We have all these fabulous gardens. We have all this wonderful food, and yet we don't have, we know we have people in the valley that can benefit from it. And it's just the coordination, the phone calling, and everything else. It sickens me. I live in Whitefish, and it sickens me that they're going to cut down these trees. And I'm going to take it on as a personal <laughs> upfront to save these fruit trees. Because as part of a community garden with Robin, we have 54 people that have beds. We have 200 volunteers. Bobby's got volunteers. To cut down fruit trees as the solution is... We, we couldn't get anybody to pick them. But it's a, So my question is, how do they tell people? Like, no, that's they, the question. Yeah, did they say, oh, we have fruit trees? Or did they say in all the social media, there's a tree here that has fruit on it. We have a huge tree outside of our community garden that produces apples, and we just shake the thing and just collect all, you know which tree I'm talking about? We just collect all the apples or the deer get them. Mm -hmm. But it's like, that's not the solution. So I'm personally taking this on <laughs> this year for the saving the fruit trees well, and whitefish. Talk to Dana Christensen. Dana Christensen. City manager for okay. whitefish. Tell her you guys will take on the fruit trees and oh. whitefish. Okay. But Is that okay, Lauren? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll help. Yeah. I'll help. Yeah. Bobby will help. I'll help. Okay. Uh, I would contact no her on Monday. Is it a woman? Yeah, I would because I think the city is getting ready to They're remove ready several to tree it. fruit trees and yeah. other types of trees. Their tree maintenance is yeah. happening soon. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. I have lots of volunteers. Yeah. You. You, know, you screen the right ones, and I can get the right ones out. There. It's, it's just have to talk with each other. Dana Christensen. Yeah. Got yeah. it. Thank you. <laughs> so, so obviously, this is a topic that needed to be discussed. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> There's a lot of resources out there. It seems like connecting those resources is the issue. Audience or panel, in terms of collaboration and, and organizing that communication, any experience, the food bank probably doesn't have the resources to do that. Social media can sometimes miss the intended audience. Any examples of, is farmhands taking this on? Like, what is the best? vehicle or multiple, you know, vehicles to get the resources connected. And just on that note, can I just jump in and say, because I think the key is, there's, which we're all saying, there's interest, but, you know, there's no harm or foul here. It's like, I'm sure someone in the Whitefish, you know, government is trying to do the right thing. I know, I understand. No, 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 I know. <laughs> but, but my point is, is how, how do we, sure. how do we bridge this successfully? Because yeah. there's, it's hard. Dang. Oh, um, good. I'm just wondering, like, if it seems like there's, everybody has, like, a collective, it's like, yeah, we want this to happen. What are the op opportunities or potentials of just, like, writing a grant and making this somebody's job? Because it seems like there's a lot of people who are willing to help and contribute, but everybody that is also has their own jobs and their own like things. And in the middle of summer, as a farmer, it's pretty hard to you know give time to something like that. And I think if it was somebody's job who was like, all right, well, this person is the person to call for gleaning, sure. I think it could be an effective way. But I just don't know. Whether that's through again a nonprofit, whether that's through a nonprofit or, or a something, but institution. Well, yeah, or I mean, a question for Michael would be like, how did you get started? Because well, it sounds like you have a very robust system of volunteers and your phone tree. You know, how what was it like when you were first building it? I guess. 
<laughs> Basically, you did it all, right? <laughs> uh, a bottle of wine, and we'll discuss it all night long. Um, I think that generally the answer, that's a great idea, because typically if you're going to want something done on an ongoing right. basis, and it needs specific attention, at some point, if you're going to organize a valley-wide gleaning collection kind of function, you're going to need somebody who's focused on it. So I, I absolutely agree with that. But I think there are things you can do to begin with, because we just responded to the market, um, to opportunities. And initially, we had not a clue. So somebody would, say, would call and say, hey, my backyard apple tree is producing apples like crazy. I can't pick them up and pick them, etc. Would you like them? And then we'd scramble around, okay, what are we going to do? And out of that just evolved more of a structure. But in that structure, one of the things I think that we learned is that we have to be creative and think about you know, maybe non, non-traditional ways to, to go out and, and glean and collect all this food. And a good example is in our center, uh, one of the local elementary schools, every other week, the second and third graders come to the center and they get to taste new kinds of foods and they get a little lesson on diet and nutrition, etc. So we had an opportunity back during the, the big uh, apple production year and the second and third graders were coming and we needed a project for them. So we had several homes around our center with backyards full of apples. So we turned it into an apple hunt. Mm-hmm. And we took, you, you never have seen so many apples picked up so fast <laughs> as you put 30 second and third graders out there with a bag <laughs> and tell them, you know, we're gonna have a prize for whoever collects the most apples. I mean, it was done in a heartbeat. So the point being, you, you need to approach this in a, in a very creative way. I don't think there's any one right way to do it. There's a lot of good ways to do it. And um, I think that's kind of what we've evolved into. We've got this structure, but you know, it took us some trial and error to get to a, a structure in which we've got confidence. Yeah, I would just uh, just add that um, you know, as farmers in the field, like a lot of a lot of things that we grow, there's a very narrow window and a very narrow time frame to actually get that out while it's still edible. And so it would be, yeah, it would be fantastic to have like a contact person that farmers or anybody that has fruit trees, any any surplus abundance of any kind of food, um, a contact person would be great. And definitely, uh, food banks. Uh, you know, we've been utilizing food banks for years, but um, this year, like one of the big things that I learned was uh, one phone call to one church, and we had like 12 people within hours. So there's, I mean, what is there, 500 churches in Flathead Valley? There's a lot. So like that's a, that's a huge untapped network of people. Yeah, that's a good thing because I've got uh, Levi Lesko and his wife coming in. And- they're volunteering, and I was, and they'll be here the next week. The Vlad and Food Bank, and I was going to hit them up on uh, getting a volunteer list and everything else like that. And um, I know I'm new at this, and I know uh, I'll try to do my best. But if you'd like my number for contact, I would be happy to, you know, initially start off and then start the phone tree from there with the, the other food bank directors and let them know and see what we can get going and and whatnot. So now, so Food Bank eight eight five eight eight two one is my number. So give me a holler, I'm, you know, and I'll help try to facilitate the best we can. And I'm definitely going to start picking Mike's brain and looking at, at different things. And, <laughs> you know, so, but it's, it's just all part of being help and, and, and connecting the dots. So if we can just kind of semi-connect some of these dots until we get, like you said, a permanent grant writer for someone to do it permanently, that would be great. Question in the corner. Yeah, there's actually, um Plenty of gleaning groups um, around the country and even in Canada that have been working through these a lot of these issues for years. Uh, I used to live in Edmonton, Alberta, and there's an amazing gleaning group, a nonprofit organization, 
and I just got on board right as I was moving back out of the country to Montana. But their website's fantastic, and you can Google it and learn a lot from what they've already done and figure out what's working and what isn't. But a nonprofit organization, for them, it was just a bunch of people who like were available, and they did the processing at the end of the year, and they were able to take like something like 25% of the fruit home that they wanted, and then 50% went to the um, to the I can't remember how it went, but um, <laughs> what was the name of the group? Um, I can't remember at the moment. Edmund or something. Brooke, did you have a question? Uh, a couple of things. One is um, we actually have a local wholesale distribution network. So we are visiting, we're talking to a lot of the Valley farmers on a weekly basis, if not more than that. We distribute around the Valley twice a week. We are, our primary outlet is to chefs. But so if there's a way that we can help transport your food, just let us know. Additionally, if I know there are chefs who could utilize corn that's the top's been nicked off by the blackbirds, conveying that message, I might be able to help or I'll get like, like let Laura know at the food bank. Um, I just think that I could also help facilitate some of those connections around the valley. So if anyone ever wants to What's the, uh, what's the, Name of the up? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Wicked Good Produce. So, I'm driving. We drive around the valley uh, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. So we can help move large. We have a delivery truck, so we can help move large quantities around the valley for you. We go the whole valley wide. So, and then the other thing, um, I know there's been a lot of conversation about fruit, which is obviously a big overabundance. Um, but it is also connecting with the farms because we have a small farm too and there's lots of times like maybe the lettuce has got some hail damage but it's still edible, it's just not perfect. And so we just, we just mow it down and it is a function of time because I need to replant that bed so the quicker we can get that information out there is great. And the other thing is seeds. Um, we are at Free the Seeds mm -hmm. and I'm gonna put a plug in there. There's, uh, as becoming a more resilient and sustainable community seed saving is really important so even if you have like your chive plant is going to seed or your echinacea like getting that part reconnected here in this uh, because it downstairs we have thousands of seed packets but a lot of those came from companies that were donated outside it's getting harder and harder for that so that's also a part of our resiliency and in food uh, seeds as well would be important to save and you could just contact free the seeds by email and someone will take care of the seeds for you. Yeah, for sure. I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Andrea Bachman and I'm one of the youth program directors at CryJ, we're the Center for Restorative Youth Justice. And in the summer, we operate a lot of our programming at the garden that's on Three Mile Drive right in front of the middle school. We're actually hired in garden manager right now, if anyone's interested. Um, but the reason I said something is because our youth, every week we have a, a cooking workshop and every other week we prepare a meal for a family in the community and so we'd love to partner with anyone who has that it's a smaller amount of food right but a lot of our kids are also interested in food service and are great kids they just they just need some support and would love to either earn community service hours or work for someone doing that kind of thing so if you want to connect you know. all right well we are about out of time <coughs> I just had a question yes have any of you tried any of the community event, things like radio or newspaper for cleaning events? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to happen. Yeah. All right. I just want to thank the panel. That was terrific. Yeah. Thank you.